Let's all stand together. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. I'm so glad for every person that is here today. If you're a guest worshiping with us today, we are so delighted that you are with the Calvary family today. I want to say it's so great to have Chad and Autumn Rogers here. As we have announced the last couple of weeks, uh, Chad and Kendall, their daughter, have dealt with COVID. So that you are aware, we have far surpassed satisfying CDC regulations for Chad and Autumn being in church today. He said, Pastor, can I come back? And I said, oh, Chad, what do the CDC regulations say? So we went over those, and then Bishop and I talked, and uh, we are quite confident we have satisfied those. So we do not operate in fear today or foolishness, but we are thankful that everything that we have prayed has come to pass. I will tell you that today is not an ordinary day. Today is not another day where we mark Sunday off of the calendar and say we went to church. God is going to do powerful things today. There's an anointing of the Holy Ghost here. There's a moving of the Spirit here. And God is going to do great things. With that thought in mind and with expectation in your heart, would you lift your hands? Would you lift your voice? Would you lift your heart? And would you cry out to the Lord as we welcome His presence into this place, as we move deeper into the Spirit? Lord God, I pray right now, as we press into your presence, I pray that you move through this house and have your way today as we press deeper into your presence. I pray, Lord God, you hear our prayer. You hear our cry. And you visit us with an anointing today, with power, with understanding, and with revelation. Let's worship the Lord today.
on him right now. Don't look around, don't look around. There's such a thick presence of the Lord here. Why don't you lift up your hands and begin to call on the name of Jesus. Right where you are, if you're in your pew, if you're sitting down, if you're in the altar, lift up your hands and call on the name of Jesus.
touch a little bit in the spirit. There's something going on that we need to tap into. We need to press into. There's a deeper move of the spirit and we cannot be satisfied on shallow ground today, but we must go into waters that we can swim in. We're in control when they're just knee deep and they're just waist deep. But if we will press in to waters we can swim in, there's something in the spirit here this morning. Would you press a little bit? Would you press in to what's going on in the spirit? We're at the point in the service where on an ordinary or a scheduled Sunday where we would pray for needs, for people to be healed, for people to be restored. But I believe that we're going to look inward in our prayers right now and we're going to pray that we would become activated in the Spirit. This is an appointed day for someone who has loosened their grip on things in the spirit who has allowed their fingers to slip from the moving of the spirit and there is going to be a reestablished grip or strong hand on the moving of the spirit today and there is not one person in this building by accident today God appointed you to be here I see faces I haven't seen in a while and you have been longing for a move of the Spirit and you are in it now, don't miss out on it. Would you lift your voice with me right now? And if you have walked away from your guard, if you have loosened your grip, would you re-engage in the Spirit? Lord Jesus, I'm asking right now that there'd be a re-engagement in the Spirit, that we would tap into what you are speaking for this day, for this moment, for this service. I ain't on the boat.
This is that, and we are they. This is that which was prophesied by Joel. In the last days, the Lord would pour out of his spirit upon all flesh, and we are they. They are not drunk as ye suppose. But this is the power of the Holy Ghost. And if you have been searching for something more, I point you to the book of Acts where Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. And be baptized, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I feel so much going on in the spirit today, but there are people who are new to this. If you are new to this, you've never experienced an apostolic church. We take our directive from the book of Acts. We find it just like it was preached on the day it was launched. When Peter stood up, when people didn't know what was going on, he brought clarity to their confusion. I would love for us to be able to move around the building right now and shake hands, but why don't you look and find someone you haven't seen in a while and wave and smile real big at them. As you're making your way back to your seats, I have some announcements this morning. fact it's going to take me a little bit you may be seated for the third Sunday in a row I'd like to say it's an honor to have my sisters-in-law Amber and Autumn here so glad y'all are here again this Sunday I fear that if they don't head out soon they will have squatters rights and I will claim them on my taxes next year They've worked very hard at the house and been very kind. It's been good to have them. Amber, or Autumn said yesterday, you're going to miss me. I said, I am, but it'll be in August. So glad that my wife has sisters and nephews and a brother-in-law, and I was added to a family that's a great family. It's been great to have them here. Also with us today, Brother Josh Herring is here, and he's going to be preaching in a little bit. We're so glad he's here today. Brother Herring comes with a tribe. His wife, Janae, is here. Their oldest boy, Jet. And then there's Jude. And then there's Jade. And then there's a baby going to be here in a few weeks. And we honor them and thank them for being here today. Janae and kids, we're so glad you're here. gave Jude a blue Gatorade yesterday and so at dinner he had a blue mustache last night but it appears as though he's got it all washed off great kids and we're going to experience today a new ministry at Calvary and uh, as I've mentioned leading up to this week the Josh Herring uh, has been under the tutelage of Brother Eli Hernandez for more than 20 years, and how fitting for Brother Herring to be here following the passing of Brother Hernandez. It's all fit together, and you'll see in a little bit the influence that Brother Hernandez has had on Brother Herring's ministry, and I believe that this will be a ministry that will become very familiar to this church. I will say, um, before we move on in the service, when Brother Herring does come to preach, Please trust him as Bishop and I trust him. Please don't take a time to decide whether you're going to like his ministry or whether you like his personality or his voice or his intensity or after, I'll judge whether I'm going to like it after he says it. He's here because he's a man of God in the will of God and Bishop and I felt like it was the timing. So when he takes the mic, we trust him immediately. Amen. We do respect social distancing if you choose so. But I will say that at the time of the altar call is given, if you want to be prayed for like we find in the word by the laying on of hands, if you move in front 
of these chairs on the front row, we will pray with you like they did in the New Testament by the laying on of hands. And uh, I know that something is transferred when we lay hands on one another and pray for one another. And I've also seen since we came back to in-person services, multiple people filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost and baptized in Jesus' name. And if you've never had that experience, today's a great day to have that experience. Wednesday night connect will be online again I'll be teaching Wednesday night and uh, I am excited about that next Sunday we will again have pre-service prayer at 9 15 in the chapel it was good to be in there today and pray with the body that I have missed so much next Sunday morning at 10 a.m. brother Vinny Azzolini will be preaching and then two weeks from today, I'll be preaching. Bishop preached last week. Brother Herring's this week. Brother Azzalini is next week. So I will have a lot to say after not preaching for four weeks. But the Lord's already begun to deal with me about what is essential. What is essential. And so I'll be preaching to you about things that are essential on that Sunday. There are five ways to give, and most of you have them memorized because I talk to you about them every single week. You can give five different ways. You can drop it off on your way in. There's a black box in the foyer, and you can drop your... Sorry for the interruption, Pastor. No problem. So as I'm taking up the offering? Are you? No, I'm not. Okay. I'll let you finish that in a minute. Our pastor has a birthday on Thursday. And so I'm excited that I'm here today to be able to present you with your birthday gift from the church for this year. And we hope you enjoy it. We hope you get a lot of use out of it. I think you will. So let's, let's all wish pastor a happy birthday. We love you. We love you so much. Thank you for being you. Thank you for being who you are and who God has called you to be. This church loves you. Happy birthday. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Apparently, there are six ways to give. I am my father's son, but we don't open gifts alike. I know what this does. This goes on top of my deer rifle. And I have been wanting to buy this and Aubrey kept saying, your birthday's coming up, your birthday's coming up. Don't buy that for yourself. Thank you so much. That's the one I've been looking at. I'll get used out of that by this time next week. Thank you all so much for your kindness. I will be 36 on Thursday. I married young. I didn't get married young. I married young. <laughs> I've been fretting about my gray hair, and Aubrey said, oh, but babe, you're going to look so good with that salt and pepper hair. I said, it doesn't have to come right away. And then Chad the other day tried to prophesy to me that I was going to be 40 and bald soon. I did not receive that at all. I was out of town Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and I think Aubrey tried to confirm with Autumn that my birthday gift did arrive. And Autumn replied, I know you sneaky pastor. You're just trying to figure out what you got for your birthday. And Aubrey said, no, pastor's in Florida. I really want to know what did we get him and did it really come in. So I had no idea, but thank you all so much. There are five ways to give. You can drop it off in the foyer on your way in or on your way out. And uh, if you'd want to sneak out during the offering song and drop it in there, that would be appropriate. But if you go out, please come back in. There's more here for you than what you've experienced so far. You can also mail it in to 551 West Schrock Road, Westerville, Ohio, 43081. You can use bill pay through your bank. You can text 614-808-8040. Or you can go to calvarycolumbus.com, scroll to the bottom of the page, and click Give. When you click Give, it'll take you to the instructions that I have just given you. 
And so if you missed any of those and you wanted them, they're at calvarycolumbus.com. Scroll to the bottom and click give. But also there, there is a place you can give safely online. And again, I will say how great it is to pastor a church that has been faithful in this time of pandemic. Thank you so much for your faithfulness when we've been going through this pandemic. Your obedience puts you in the path of blessing. It's not about the amount of sacrifice. It's the place of obedience that puts you in line for blessing. So if you're looking to be blessed, be obedient. God bless you this morning. Bishop, would you come and receive the offering? Would you welcome him as he comes? Peace, peace, wonderful peace coming down from the Father. on that peace I will assure you there is a powerful anointing of the Holy Ghost here today to minister to your need we're going to pray for the offering in a moment but you can't miss what God brought you into this place for you can't miss the atmosphere that God put us here to bask in oh peace peace wonderful peace coming down from the Father of your mind, your heart, your spirit. In Jesus' name. Must be a horrible thing to live in fear. Must be a horrible thing to live in turmoil. But you don't have to live in fear and you don't have to live in turmoil. And have the peace of God resonant in your heart prevailing over everything on the outside every day let's stand together 
I thank you for being sensitive to the move of the Holy Ghost. And I will tell you, I was so excited to get to the prayer room this morning. Can't figure out why somebody, some people could make it for 9 o'clock service when we were having two services and they couldn't make it at 9.15 to pray. Mm. Ah. Thank you for your faithfulness to the house of the Lord during all of this that's been going on. And I'd just like to take a survey this morning. Has God been faithful to you? I want to testify, God has been good to his people. God has been good to the church. God has been faithful. And so if this is your first time with us, I want you to get addicted. And if you haven't been to the well for a while, You need to go in for another dip. Ah, hallelujah. And so if you've already returned the tithe and given offerings, we're going to pray for what you've already done. And if you're about to, we're going to pray for what you're about to do. And if you plan to do it on the way out of the building, someday we'll probably pass plates again, but... Bible, they just brought it, put it in a box. Nobody even guarded it, and they didn't count it after every service. The king just said, went and uh, said, go find out if there's enough. And there was so much they had to build, ah, God, they had to build a storehouse uh, to put uh, what the people had brought of the blessing of the Lord. It is the will of God for this to be a storehouse, a reservoir, a blessing because of God's blessing on your life. Jesus, I pray that you will multiply everything that we put in the offering, that we're about to put in the offering. I pray, Lord God, that you will let your abundant blessing be multiplied upon your people. The return of the tithe, the giving of our offerings. Let your blessing be expressed in the work of the Lord around the world through our giving today. And I pray, Jesus, that after we have been faithful to return the tithe and bring offerings, that you will multiply everything we have left over to meet the needs of our lives, our homes, our families. And I ask you, Lord, that as you did for your people in Goshen, you will suspend the rules that are applying to everyone outside of Goshen. They can live under whatever they want to live under, but here in Goshen, that there will be light when there's darkness on the outside, that there will, when there's plague on the outside, that there will be health and healing here. In Jesus' name, we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. And everyone said amen. God bless you. Let's worship the Lord. Oh, yeah. Come on, put your hands together. As I look, as I look.
He's worthy, He's worthy, He's worthy, He's worthy. We love you, Jesus. If you are physically able, would you stand to your feet and give an applause to the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is in this house. And he alone is worthy. It is my distinct honor to bring to you evangelist Josh Herring. I have uh, been acquainted with him for a number of years. And we have attempted to arrange a time for him to be with us. And I don't know how many times we've tried this, Brother Harry, and it just hasn't worked. But he comes to you today in the perfect will of God and in the timing of the will of God. Would you receive the man of God as he comes? Brother Harry, preach the word. Let the Lord have his way in Jesus' name. Let's magnify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ one more time and clap our hands and lift our voice and somebody make hell hear you right now. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and magnify the name that's above every other name. Hallelujah, the name of Jesus. Praise God. This is the atmosphere where you fight for your faith. Paul said, fight the good fight of faith. There's two words fight there. The first one is agonizomai, which means to contend with an adversary. But the second word, fight the good fight of faith, is agon in the Greek, which means the arena or the assembly where the fight takes place. You can't afford to skip church in this day and hour because this is the arena where you fight for everything the devil's been battling you with all week long. So now that you're in the arena, Why don't you be you right now and worship that name? Somebody punch the devil back for what you've been through. Somebody praise that name of the Lord Jesus. There is such an atmosphere in here of revelation. Hallelujah. I give high, high honor to Bishop Stark, who obviously is a general among us. If you love the bishop, would you clap your hands and Get loud, I give him such honor. If you knew who Billy Cole was and you watch your bishop very much, you can see Brother Billy Cole in him. Wow, what authority you have. And I give high honor to your pastor, falling right in his footstep, Brother Jimmy Stark. And if you love your pastor, get loud as you can, who's a great man of God. I can feel the anointing upon him in this pulpit. I give high honor to their entire family. Give honor to my beautiful wife and my children looking so beautiful over there. So thankful to have them with me. And I I, I just know that uh, she has a lot of compassion and mercy to travel with me at eight months pregnant with our fourth baby. And... um, The Lord has been so good to us, and I'm so thankful to have her with me, and it's such a blessing to be in the kingdom of the Lord. First time here, so thankful to be with all of you, and I feel to uh, just step right in and hopefully feel at home here. I like what I feel, and Brother Hernandez obviously created a great pathway in this church, and I know you had high admiration for him. Thank you for all that you did for him, and thank you for loving him. He was so powerful. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. In fact, Sister Hernandez texted me this morning that she is up interceding for this service. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Brother Hector Robles, my good friend, I love you very much. I'm so glad you're here. Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein time past ye walked according 
to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation, say our conversation, in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And I want to preach from the subject this morning, attracting heavenly atmospheres. Attracting heavenly atmospheres. I want you to open up your spirit, as most of you have already done, and open up your heart to the will of God, and let him speak directly to your family, to your situation, to your mind. Would you do that right now? Lord Jesus, take over the entire building. We take dominion and authority over any spirit that's not of God. We worship you for what you're about to do. We praise you for the angels you are sending. And we magnify you for the change that you're going to create in homes today. I thank you in advance for miracles that are in this room. And I glorify you. Loose your anointing. Loose your power, I pray. Anoint my mind. Anoint my tongue. In Jesus' name, anoint the people. And we will give you all the praise and all the glory. And if you love him, would you clap? to him one more time and just magnify him like nobody is in the room but you we worship you Lord Jesus hallelujah and you may be seated the word atmosphere is the envelope of gases surrounding the earth or another planet another definition is the pervading tone or mood in a place or a situation, and thirdly, the air in any particular place. The Bible says the devil is called the prince of the power of the air. Prince is ruler, commander, and chief. Power right here is power of choice. Liberty of doing as one pleases. And air is atmosphere. So he's the commander or the ruler of your power of choice and giving you liberty to do as you please in the air. It is interesting that the devil wants his atmosphere, which is in the air, to come down to the earth in your situation. A lot of people believe that the world belongs to the devil, but the Bible said the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And so we know that heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. So the devil controls the air, which basically means he's just in the way of what God is doing. Aren't you thankful that you serve a God that has all power and authority where you live? Satan is a trespasser, and he tries to convince this world that he has all authority and power over everything in this world. That is not true. In fact, as Brother Hernandez taught me a long time ago, he controls the air and nothing else. And so anytime you get a word from God that comes to you, you must understand that word has gone through the atmosphere of hell already to get to you. And so therefore you should rejoice in that because the thing that God is telling you cannot be resisted and cannot be blocked because it's already gone through all the power of the enemy. So if you've got a promise from God, do not let the devil lie to you and deceive you. That's not going to come to pass. The word has already broken through the atmosphere and is into your life. It is interesting, though, how he wants his atmosphere, which is 
strife and fear as Bishop has already talked to us about to enter into our atmosphere and into our homes and into our lives. And it's very interesting how he uses things to control the atmosphere. The devil was never given any weapons of war when he was Lucifer in heaven. His greatest weapon was obviously his voice and he was the sound of music. So therefore, he has been working with a voice of war for several thousand years against mankind. He talks big and he speaks big. And I'm not here to confront him in the flesh. I'm here to expose him that he's not really what he says he is to a lot of you. And you've got more authority in your finger than you, than all the powers of hell. Jesus and I cast out devils by the finger of God. But he uses his mouth, and therefore when he gets into an atmosphere, he uses people's mouths to control the atmosphere. Your speech determines what happens in the atmosphere of your home. Your words can calm a situation, and your words can intensify a situation. Your words can bring healing, and your words can bring destruction. Your words can bring peace, and your words can bring peril. And it's the will of Satan for every, every marriage to be in strife and division, for every teenager to be rebellious verbally against the parent. It's the will of Satan for the words to continually be fear and negative. And is God really there? And if you've been talking like that, you've got a devil near your house who's got the atmosphere just like he likes it. But before you leave this room, when you get out of here, there will be a shift in the atmosphere of your house and you will speak like you have never spoken before. Somebody ought to praise him right now in this atmosphere and change it for the glory of God to move. Your speech determines what happens. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So whatever you're speaking in the atmosphere of the room is truly an atmosphere in your heart already that's going on. And now Satan desires, if it's evil, to make the atmosphere of your heart manifest in the room. Manifest in the marriage. Manifest in the conversation. It is the will of the enemy to get every child of God at division against leadership, against authority, against the plan of God. It's the perfect plan of Satan to get your mouth. He don't even mind it if you will. I'm just going to be me. Is that, can I come down here? I'm coming either way, so... He doesn't mind it if you talk perfectly spiritual in here. He doesn't care what you really say, but if he can get you to be almost completely opposite at home, he, he loves it if you shake Bishop's hand in here and tell Pastor and Bishop how submitted you are. But if you will crush them at the dinner table with your family, he has you right where he wants you because you are literally speaking the atmosphere of hell into your life. It's quiet, but it's right. He loves to argue. The spirit of control is an arguing spirit. Spirits love to argue. Spirits like it when humans argue. It's the will of Satan for arguing to take place. Let me show you uh, something in the Bible, the book of Jude. There's only one chapter, but this is so beautiful. Jude, uh, chapter 1, obviously, verses 8 and 9. You've got a fight going on between Michael the archangel and Lucifer or Satan. And so they're fighting over 
of the dead body of Moses. And the Bible said, likewise also, these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke thee. The Lord spoke this to me a couple weeks ago. He said, if my people are going to argue, they need to learn to argue like angels do. I said, what do you mean? He said, angels do not argue from a position of trying to prove their point, but they rather speak from a position of victory in who they are submitted to. Michael said, I already know something about you, Satan. You're powerful with your mouth. I'm not falling for the bait. I'm going to speak from the position of authority that I stand in. I'm not going to rebuke you, but instead the Lord rebuke thee. I know who I'm submitted to, and because I know who I am submitted to, I can count on his authority flowing through me when I speak. See, it's the will of the enemy to get you to try to prove your point. It's the will of the enemy to get you to try to prove your point and win the argument. I'd rather lose the argument and win the atmosphere. Because when you don't fall for the bait, when you don't react like you always react, you cause Satan to try to find a different plan. He's not trying to get a win-loss in the argument. He just wants the atmosphere to be argumentative in your home. But when somebody gets spiritual and says, you can say what you want to, but I'm not going to fall for that. We're going to have an atmosphere of peace in this house. Then you cause confusion in the demonic realm because Satan does not know what to do with that. Don't try to prove your point. You serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We rebuke him in the name of Jesus. Your spouse is not the enemy. The spirit talking through them. Remember, this is off my notes, but I feel it. Remember when, when Job was attacked by Satan, and he worshiped God anyway despite all the things that died. And Satan goes back and reports to God, and God said, no matter what you try, Job's going to hold on to his integrity. And Satan said, yeah, but let me, let me curse his body, and let me strike his body. He'll curse you to your face. God said, go ahead. He comes down, strikes Job with boils, and the next verse, Job's wife walks in and says, Dost thou still hold thine integrity? Why does she care about his integrity? Because it's not her talking. In fact, Job said, You talk like a foolish woman. I don't even know the source of the words coming out of your mouth. See, it was Satan's desire after killing everything to create division and arguing in the home. But Job said, I'm not going to fall for that. That's a spirit talking through her. He said, naked came I in, naked shall I depart. The Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, though he slay me. What's the rest of it? Yet shall I trust him. That's why Satan could wreak havoc in the first two chapters, but not be mentioned in the last 40 chapters of the book of Job. Not one time, because Job had power over the atmosphere. Satan could attack his body, could attack his family, could attack his stuff, but he couldn't control the atmosphere because Job had made up his mind. I will speak what God says to speak. And Satan was never mentioned again in his life. Powerful. Your words determine what you attract. What you talk about determines what shows up. Stop giving the devil credit for everything in your life. 
stop blaming the devil for everything that goes wrong. Every time you blame him, you're praising him for what he wants. He likes to be blamed when things go wrong. What you're telling hell is you're the one causing. You've got greater power than me, and you're causing this pain in my life. He cannot stand it when a child of God says, I know what's used to hit me, but I also know the king of the atmosphere. You might be the prince of the air, but there's someone greater than the prince. He's the king of all kings. He's the Lord of all lords, and he has authority over everything in the atmosphere. That makes sense to you? What you talk about, Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. I'll just throw it in there because I want you to see. But Philippians 3, 20, for our conversation is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. According to the working thereby, he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. All this stuff is a product of you knowing that your conversation is in heaven right now. Things are listening to you. You don't think heaven and hell care about your words? Go to Daniel. I'm, I'm in the Bible. Go to Daniel chapter 10, and you know the story. Daniel chapter 10, verse number 10. The angel's talking to Daniel. He said, Behold, and hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands, Daniel said. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then he said unto me, fear not. Oh, somebody needs to get that. Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. He said, I'm an angel from God, and we heard you, and I've come to pick up your words and take them up before the throne and dump them out. That's how your prayers get to God. Angels pick them up, Revelation 5, Revelation 8, and they dump them out before the Lord. And the angel said, the prince of Persia, where Daniel's, where Daniel's living, this head demon, this principality, he was in the way fighting the angel 21 days. And then he said, the angel said, when I go back with your words, this demon and the prince of Grecia, another demon, are going to try to block me from taking your words up to heaven. Watch this. Hell completely abandoned their post in a different nation. The prince of Grecia literally said, nobody here is affecting the spirit world, but there's one guy named Daniel who will not stop praying and will not stop fasting, and so I'm going to try to block his words. When you're getting attacked by the enemy, it's not a time to hang your head. Obviously, something is going on. Hell is reactionary. They do not create. They react. And so if they're reacting and attacking, it's because something must be near. Demons do not know if you're going to leave the parking lot and go left, go right, drive five miles. They don't know that. You know what they know? The only thing they can, that they have a knowledge of is when angels are coming through their airspace towards you. They don't know everything you're going to do. Stop saying, stop saying that. They don't know what you're going to do. Satan is not omnipotent and omnipresent, and he's definitely not omniscient. He does not know what you're going to do, but he can tell when angels have been dispatched into your community, and so therefore he reacts. And if there are angels coming to Columbus, guess where the first place he looks to attack is? This is the bishop's house. This is the place where the leadership of this entire state is. Don't you think if Satan knows revival, well, I feel the Holy Ghost is coming to Ohio. He starts stirring up everything. Why do you think the Satanists were in your city last weekend? 
I'll tell you why. Because they sense angelic movement headed toward this city and they cannot stop it. And they're reacting. They're trying to create fear and worry. But don't you give in to that. You start praising God and make the atmosphere open. That's why praying the word of God out loud is so powerful. See, the Bible says the word of the Lord is a sore of the spirit. So I'm going to just give you a little something here. Anytime you read the word out loud, you read the armor of God, Ephesians 6, and all these different things in the armor, then very end, right before you pray always, you get the sword out. Ready? Before you release your prayer to the atmosphere, he said, get the sword out. When you start to read the word out loud, you're creating a pathway in the atmosphere for your prayer to go up. When you read the word silently, you're creating a pathway inwardly for the word to affect what's going on inside of you. But anytime you feel prompted, well, I feel, feel God right now. Anytime you feel prompted to read the word of God out loud or to play it out loud in your atmosphere, it's because God has plans for your prayers to get to him. And something is in the way. So you've got to change, Shata. You've got to change the atmosphere. Somebody ought to get the word loose in your house. Get the word loose in your bedroom. Get it loose in your car, and you'll find an opening to pray. Well, I just can't break through in prayer. Change the atmosphere with the word. Swing the sword and create a pathway for the word to go. You can release that prayer. Ooh. Heaven, I want to say this to you. Heaven can get to any situation if the atmosphere gets changed. It doesn't matter how hellacious it is. If you start praying, you don't believe me, just ask Paul and Silas. Backs beaten, legs beaten, hands bound, feet bound. But the one thing the devil forgot to do he forgot to bind their mouth. And it all hell's breaking loose. And Paul said, I feel like singing. And I feel like praying. And God said, I feel like moving. Anytime somebody going through hell and they can't get out of it any way they look left or right, up or down, opens up their mouth and says, I can't fix it, but I can change the atmosphere right now. When you do that, you open up a pathway for God to shake the very foundation of the place that you're living If you don't know where the money's going to come from, if you don't know if God's going to answer the prayer, don't worry about trying to fix it. Just change the atmosphere into a place where God can move among you. Well, I don't know if God will show up. I don't know if God will do it. You're speaking death. Questions are what Satan loves. But can I just give you a little, I know most of you, you're so deeper, you're way deeper than I'll ever be. But can you, can I just give you a little something? When you talk about heaven, heaven will show up. Go to, go to Luke chapter 2. I think it's verse 10. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. I'll put it in my Bible here. I gotta, you know, this, this is something I want you to see. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. Here's the angel telling the shepherds what's going on. The angel said to them, fear not. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, which heavenly host in your Bible means army or military. Not some fairy angels flying around. These are warring angels made out of fire. And these angels showed up. They weren't even supposed to be there. But when another angel started talking about the birth of Jesus, heaven said, we've got to get down where he's being talked about. 
Are you talking about him in your house? Are you talking about him in your house? Well, this is going wrong. We've got COVID. We've got social unrest. We've got everything. Yes, it is. What are you talking about? I mean, they might be loose all over your street and all in your neighborhood. The spirit world might be crazy, but there ought to be a spiritual sign on your yard that you can't come in here because the atmosphere is not going to be like you think. This is an atmosphere of worship and praise and glory and peace and healing and unity. How you t- I remember we were, in, we were in Atlanta a few months ago in between the first and second service, and there was a lady, had a little boy about five, six years old, and grandma and grandpa standing there. I was walking out trying to rush to the hotel to get my wife to come back for the second service, and I just preached my guts out, so I'm walking, and he grabs my coat, and he said, hey, wait a second. He said, can you, can you pray for our grandson? He's never spoken in his life. And he just, little boy looked at me, severe autism. And I said, yeah, yeah. And when I went to prayer, I looked at the mom, and you could just see the defeat. Like, I'm, I don't think it can happen. I don't know. I'm just, I've prayed every prayer. Have you ever felt like that? I've prayed everything I know how to pray. Somebody over here feels like that. I've prayed everything I'm supposed to pray, and I don't know what I'm supposed to do now. Sure, go ahead and pray. See, when when you're in the dimension of hopelessness, you wear it on your face. It's very easy for people to see when there's hopelessness in your spirit because, because you wear it. You don't mean to wear it, but you wear it. It's just there, and you're trying not to, to show it. You're trying to smile. I'm doing fine. Everything's good. Praise the Lord. And then inwardly, you're like, God, are you, do you not care about this? Am I just de- destined to die with this? Is this supposed to be part of my life for the rest of my life? And you sit there, and you let that consume you. And she's sitting there letting that hopelessness. And so I started to pray for the boy. I said, God, let him speak. Open his mouth. And the boy's just staring at me. And then I turn to the mother. And I said, I speak faith to her that she would remember how she used to pray. She began to tremble, Pastor Star. She began to tremble, and you could see the countenance of her face change from hopelessness to faith that God might just do something. And that prayer meeting ended, nothing happened. But the next day at school, when he was sitting there and they were showing a video of colors, he began to repeat the words he heard on the screen. And the next week, he told his mom and dad, I love you. And before long, God has opened his mouth. Why? Because somebody changed the I'm reminded of a story years ago where, I think it's back in the 60s, where a, a lady in Monroe, Louisiana, had a backslidden husband. He wouldn't come to church. Mocked her when she went to church. Boy, I feel the Holy Ghost. There's about to be a harvest of backsliders in this church. I sense it in the Holy Ghost. Some of you have been praying for a long time, and God has dispatched angels in this city to sever relationships and addictions because he's about to bring them back in here. Stop speaking in doubt. Stop speaking in fear. Stop speaking in anxiety. And start releasing faith out of your spirit. And she, he would laugh at her. He would cuss at her. Can you please come to church? He'd say, I'll never go to church. And every service, Pastor, she would stand up. And she would ask the church, can you pray for my husband for years? Every service, Brother Hector, every service. Can you all pray for my husband? Nothing would happen. And one Wednesday night, she stood up and said, prayer request time. You know, like we used to do, everybody had a prayer request. 
yes, sister, you all pray for my husband. And the pastor said, no. He said, you will not ask that ever again. (laughs) Sounds like an evangelist, but apparently it was the pastor. And he said this, instead of asking us to pray, from now on every service, you will go at your house, you'll lay his clothes out and his boots out. You will ask him to come. When he doesn't come, you will go to the corner. They had a corner called Shouter's Corner. And every song service, you will shout and worship God for him coming. Oh, I'm gonna, I feel the Holy Ghost just flip something right. And for two years, she would ask him, he would laugh, he would cuss, she would lay out the clothes, he would mock her, and she'd get down to the church right where Pastor is, and she'd go to shouting. Thank you, God, for saving my husband. Thank you, God, for bringing him in. Every service, and two years later, on a Sunday night, after he had mocked her before church, she was down in Shouter's Corner, and when he was at home, he started putting the clothes on, and he put the boots on, and he made his way to the church, and he walked down to the front, and he raised his hands, and God filled him with the Holy Ghost while she was shouting in the corner. Come on, change the atmosphere, change the atmosphere, change the atmosphere, change the atmosphere. Come on, let hell know we're about to have revival. We're about to see the harvest. We're about to see the kids pray through, the friends pray through, the loved ones pray through. I feel it in here. Stand to your feet right now. I feel it in here right now. I'm going to give you a little secret. You may not shout it. You may not shout. Let's all stand. You may not shout, but I want you to, I want you to understand this. <coughs> Brother Hernandez taught me this. This was Brother Barnes. Taught that. I'm, sure, I'm sure Bishop knows all this. But he said that you will see more miracles when you preach on the oneness of God than any other subject, right? Okay. When you preach about healing, you describe what God does, but when you preach about the oneness of God, you describe who he is. And so, while we <coughs> kind of patty cake praise verses on the oneness of God, demons get nervous that you believe this. Sicknesses get nervous you believe this. And I know it's going to sound crazy, but when you start to declare things on the oneness of God, the atmosphere has to change. Because whatever has tried to be God in your atmosphere has just been told, get off the throne, you're a trespasser, and there's a new king. So this is for Satan and every spirit in Columbus. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou believest there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble at the name of Jesus. Every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ Somebody praise that one true God. Somebody worship that one true God. Somebody magnify that one true God. You don't need to be afraid. You just need to praise the one who has all power and authority. There are angels all over this room right now. There are angels all in this room right now. (laughs) 
Somebody lose a war cry in the atmosphere. Somebody lose a war cry in the atmosphere. That's why hell hates church. He hates it when you talk in tongues. He doesn't know what you're saying. He doesn't know what you're doing. But you're changing the atmosphere. There's nothing more powerful than your words right now. The miracles in your own mouth. The miracles in your own mouth. The miracles in your own mouth. You don't need me to lay hands on you. Release it out of your mouth. Release it out of your mouth. I curse condemnation in the name of Jesus trying to attach itself to a guest in this room right now. We're not condemning you. You're in the right atmosphere. You're in the right atmosphere. For unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that worketh within us. You have the key to change everything. I want to say something right now that I feel. Shadrach had no idea if he was going to live or die in that fire. He didn't know. He said, I know our God's able to deliver us. But if not, we're not bowing down. The Lord said there will be the releasing of the spirit of Shadrach in the altar call. Where no matter what the outcome is for your situation, you will not bind your faith to the outcome. You will bind your faith to the atmosphere that you will command to be released. You will not say, well, I'm only going to have faith if I get what I want. But you're going to say, I don't care if I get what what I want or I do not get what I want. I'm not bowing down to the pressure of the world. I am going to stay in the vein of worship. The biggest mistake Nebuchadnezzar made was he built the furnace too big. Because when they fell in there and they got loosed, the Bible said they started walking. And that's what hell hates that you recognize that the bigger your fire, the bigger your party after it's over. And you're going through hell right now. But the more hell you're going through, the greater worship ought to be coming out of you as you change the atmosphere where you... Watch this. Paul standing before King Agrippa, whose great grandpa was Herod, who killed all the babies when Jesus was born. Whose grandpa was Herod, who killed John the Baptist, and whose father killed James in Acts 12. This is who he's standing in front of, locked up in chains, in front of a king with power to execute and kill. And Paul said these words, I think myself happy. 
You can chain me up. You can tie me up. You can bring up the past pain. But I've got victory over you in my mind. And because I've got victory right here, I can speak in the atmosphere that there's nothing that there's nothing you can do to me to make me bow. And I've got a word for somebody in the room. You ought to stand up to Agrippa and say, I'm going to think myself happy. I'm going to change the atmosphere in my mind so that no matter what I'm going through. Who will be honest and say there's been some kind of attack in our home? Raise your hand in your mind, in your conversation. Maybe you're not even doing anything wrong. Maybe someone's speaking against you. There's someone in here feeling pressure to speak against someone. I'm telling you upon the authority of the word of God in this room right now that if you will make up your mind to change the atmosphere in your own spirit, in your own thoughts, in your own words, that no matter what they say, it will not even come nigh your dwelling because God will put a hedge between you and the words. For when your ways please the Lord, he maketh even your enemies to be at peace with you. And some of you are only under attack right now because your words aren't pleasing. Pleasing God. Your ways are holy, but your words haven't been. And the Lord Shakata, the Lord said, if you'll start talking different, I'll bring peace into your house that you cannot bring on your own. One mind, one accord. Let the atmosphere ring with the sound of worship and praise and war and magnifying God. Watch. It's hell's plan for the war to be in your brain, not in the air. That's his turf. This is your turf. So if he gets you thinking more than speaking, you might be winning, but you're winning while the turf's being destroyed. You'd rather fight ISIS in Afghanistan than Columbus. That's why Elijah, when he said to the servant, go see if there's any sign of rain, the servant comes back, and in the atmosphere he says, there's nothing. Elijah has a choice. I can take the battle to my head. Oh, my goodness, I thought God was going to come through. I thought God said that there was going to be rain. Oh, boy. Oh, Lord. Where are you, Lord? Do you? But immediately he said, go again. And don't stop going. In other words, we're not fighting that battle right here. We're fighting it. You may not jump over that, but demons get nervous when you say, I don't care what you say, we are going to fight the atmosphere. That's why you, no matter what Saul says to you, David, you be silent. No matter what your brother say, you be silent. But when your enemy tells you that you're not going to have the victory, don't you dare be silent. That's defeat. That's saying, I, I give in. You've got to open your mouth in the atmosphere and say, you're going down. You're going down. You're going down. I really think, I don't even, I don't know. What's been prophesied in here? But I really think that a lot of prophecies in this room are hovering, and literally they're about to fall, and someone has a key in their own house, and the key is your mouth. And when you start consistently speaking different, and you start consistently speaking edifying words and peace words and blessings, well, I feel God, the direction that you've been asking for, the will of God that you've been asking for will fall upon you so quickly, you'll think, where did that come from? And it came from your mouth. (laughs) 
Last but not least, this pastor's about to come. I tell you, under the anunction of the Holy Ghost, that there are thousands of warring angels around this property right now, and they are waiting to go out on the command of the Lord. But the Lord said, I'll only speak when my people begin to speak differently. And when they speak with my authority from position of victory, I will dispatch to the north, the south, the east, and the west. The season for this church just shifted just now. There has been a seasonal shift in this church right now, and you're about to see the blessings fall upon you. May the Lord bless you. And may the... May the Lord bless you. Somebody praise him right now one more time. Somebody praise him one more
Why don't you speak towards somebody right now? Speak words of peace. Speak words of victory. If you feel to pray with someone, if they let you, go ahead. But if they won't, speak toward them. Speak words of peace. Speak words of victory. Speak words of comfort. The Lord is removing the distractions. The Lord is removing the distractions. And you will have clarity of thought and clarity of mind and clarity in your faith. You can get the Holy Ghost right now. You can be filled with the Holy Ghost right now. You can be baptized in Jesus' name right now. You can get delivered right now. There's not an addiction that God can't deliver you from right now. There's an atmosphere shifting in here. There's a breaking forth in here. There's a breaking through in here. You have dominion over the spirit of fear. You can step out of your pew if you want to. You don't have to be afraid. There's something in here. You've got power over everything the enemy's saying to you.
Take the atmosphere to your house. Don't let there be a separation from this atmosphere to your atmosphere. Some of you have some work to do. You can't change everybody in your house. You can't make them worship. You can't make them want to, to go after God. But start with you, how you react, how you say things. Check my tone, God, and set the atmosphere. Put the word on in your house. Put the gospel music on in your house. Put the word on your house. Change the atmosphere. Make the demons uncomfortable. Watch how the conversations start changing. Watch how God begins to move on the family member you think he can't move on. Watch how God changes things in the home. Otoboshanda, that parent of the, of the teenager that doesn't seem to have any kind of heart for God. Change the atmosphere in your home. And the atmosphere will draw the teenager out of the bedroom. What's going on, Brother Herring? Brother, what's going on right now is something is about to shift in your houses. There's a shifting going on in your spirit. The frequency of your mind is shifting from the demonic to the angelic in several homes right now. And you're going to go home talking instead of just waiting for something to erupt. You're going to go home speaking words of life and words of faith. I want to say this to you right here. I want to, I want to, I want to show you the power of your tongue. This is how real it is. Adam named every animal and was given dominion over all of them, okay? Got to know how to talk to it. You can have dominion, but if you don't name it, it doesn't matter. Got to know how to talk to it, whatever it is. Then God gives him a wife. He doesn't name her. He calls her woman. No value. Does not give her a name. She goes to the tree, gets the fruit. You know the story. Mankind falls into sin. God, not Satan, God goes on a cursing rampage. You're going to... The serpent's going to crawl on his belly. The woman's going to have pain in childbirth. The man's going to work with the spread of his brow. Ready? God speaks death to them. You're going to die. The next verse, Adam calls his wife's name Eve, for she is the mother of all living. Eve means life. Adam looks back at a God, not Satan, at God, who just said you're going to die, and says, I speak life to her. And the next verse, God kills a lamb and covers their nakedness. God goes from cursing to covering when he changes how he talks. And if God will cover when you start speaking life, the enemy will quiver when you start speaking life. So stop getting mad at the, at the spouse or the family member, but start speaking life to them in the name of Jesus, and you'll see a covering. Your pastor's prayers will cover your family, but you cannot keep uncovering them with your words. You can't keep uncovering the family, letting the enemy shoot at you when pastor's covering you. Just keep speaking, whatever my power for the Holy Ghost, what my pastor's praying for my family, what's on your mind for our family, God, whatever's your will, I cover my family. I speak life to my family and watch the atmosphere change in your house. May the Lord bless you as things are shifting right now. Last hour, Brother Herring has given us the prescription to change our condition. 
And the doctor can prescribe the necessary medication to change the condition. But unless you take it in, it will be of no effect. And so this word can be delivered to us. The prescription can be written. But unless we take it into our spirits, it's of no effect. I think you could sum up what he preached to us in these two questions. What would you speak if you knew your words would change your situation? And what would you think in your mind if you knew your thoughts would change how you spoke? What will you speak differently? Some of you make, need to make a decision before you ever leave these doors. Some of you need to get a place of consecration right now and say, God, I'm not going to talk like I've been talking because I've been bringing this on myself. And now I realize I can lift this off of my family. I can lift this off of my mind. I can lift this off of the situation. Somebody needs to lift their hands and make a decision right now. I just talked to you three Wednesday nights ago about the power of your words. You can speak yourself out of that situation, or you can take yourself deeper into it, that suffering and turmoil, or you can declare this is, this is the end of it. I no longer look at that situation like I've been looking at it, but I look at it through a different lens. My prescription has changed, and now I see that if I will speak faith, I will rise out of this.
there are angels here. Uh, Brother Herring, Russ, Dad, if I'm wrong, correct me. But I believe there's a line of angels behind me, and they're waiting on some of you to speak. And they've come, and they're here because they're anticipating you responding. And if you will speak, they will go. But they're waiting on you to give the the go-ahead. They're waiting on you to send them somewhere. And there are situations that some of you have sat in your house and cried about that you thought was impossible because it hasn't come to pass yet. Go ask Sarah if having a baby passed the time that she thought was possible. Some of you have your Ishmael's. You've tried to fabricate it, but it wasn't the promise that God had promised you. But some of you need to lift your voice right now and know the days of crying in your house are over. If you will speak what God is going to put into your spirit right now. And if you will send that angelic host to to make war on your behalf to go into that situation, uh, there is more here right now than we have tapped into. There is something deeper in the spirit. Uh, We must not be satisfied with a shallow move. Uh, We must go into a deeper move when it's available. Some of you need to become very specific like an attorney would when he'd be writing contractual words. And you need to speak the specific words and you need to cross every T and dot every I and make sure your punctuation is correct. And you need to send and speak that those angels will go into situations very specific, almost as you were as if you were telling the doctor all the symptoms you've been dealing with and exactly what's been going on so that he knows how to treat the situation. These angels are knowing that you have the words. They're just waiting on you to be specific to speak them. Bishop, do you have anything to add? It's as if you are signing a release for surgery. The last thing you do before they put you under the anesthetic, you sign a release. You need to sign a release in the spirit for the angels to operate in your behalf in your situation. Somebody respond to that word.
Brother Herring just came and said he saw them moving. Our words are working. Don't stop. We'll go a couple more minutes, and then there's one more thing God's given me. But don't stop. Things are moving in the spirit. Some of you have never operated in a dimension like this. It's not something that you have to have a degree in. It's a muscle you've got to exercise to grow more confident in it. Why don't you exercise that moving of the spirit? Why don't you practice what has just been preached in here and watch God do it? How many of you in here are having trouble sleeping at night, if you'll raise your hand? All right, I'm not going to embarrass anybody, but it's not so much what you've eaten or what you had for dinner. It's your words. It's what's going on in your house. And there are some of you that can't help the atmosphere of your house, but you can. You have control of the atmosphere of your room. If you have roommates and you have people that you live with that do not serve the Lord and they are not under the leading of the Spirit, you may not be able to control the living room, the kitchen. You may not be able to control the dining room or the den or the garage, but you can control your room. You can also control your mind. First thing I moved into my house when I bought it was an old radio that had a plug for an iPod. And I had the New Testament that plays every 18 hours for years in my house. And every time a guest wakes up in our house, the first question I ask them is, how did you sleep last night? I've asked David Smith. I've asked Bobby Wade. I've asked Drew Galloway. I've asked Dylan Morgan. And I asked my father-in-law when he was here a couple weeks ago, all preachers of the gospel. And every one of them said, I felt such peace. I had no trouble sleeping. It's not in the middle of the living room turned up on volume 100. It actually sits back behind the furnace. And it just plays at the lowest level, but the New Testament is playing every 18 hours. It repeats itself in my house. There is peace when I walk in the doors of my home. The last place you should deal with turmoil is in your house. That's your abode. That's where you live. You may not control the atmosphere on your job, but you can control the atmosphere of your vehicle and your home. Brother Herring preached to us. It was powerful and it was simple. There were things that were very deep in the spirit, but it was a very simple concept. You have more power than the enemy does. Don't live defeated when you've got more power than the enemy. Don't live as though he's the dictator because the only time he is is when you allow him to be. Lord Jesus, I pray for understanding in the minds of every person who has had trouble sleeping. I pray, Lord God, that you would quicken to their spirit the words that they have spoken that have caused them to live in turmoil. Lord, that has been robbing them of their sleep, which has been robbing them of their peace, which has, made the, which has got them out of sorts. I pray, Lord, that people would take their burdens to you and leave them there. In Jesus' name. It's not the lack of prayers you've been praying. It's what you've been saying when you're done praying. Bishop and I reference my great-grandfather grandfather on a continual basis. 
And he made it a point that when he finished praying, he didn't feel like he had to talk to anybody else about it. I feel Harper here today. I feel the presence of my great-grandfather I never met here today. God, if you would allow a blanket of what Harper had a hold of to fall on this congregation that he never knew about. Dad, will you come here? Dad. One of us need to pray in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Lift your voice, let your voice out. When you pray in the Spirit, you cannot pray amiss because the Spirit is making intercession through you. Pray in the Holy Ghost, every person. <laughs> Let your voice out, let your voice out. Don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. That's it. That's it. Press on, press on, press on, press on. And so in the 14th year of Hezekiah's reign, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all Judah. And um, he sent Rabshakeh, his general, to deliver a message to Hezekiah and the people of Judah about what he was going to do. And in verse 7, he, he said, But if thou say to me, We trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and all, whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away, and said to Judah and to Jerusalem, Ye shall worship before this altar? Now you can go back and read the 36th chapter of Isaiah at your, uh, when you get home. But Sennacherib displayed his full ignorance here when he mistakenly perceived that Hezekiah's revival in which the heathen idols and altars were thrown down was an insult to Jehovah. Sennacherib believed that Jehovah had forsaken Judah 
and he would not defend them because they did not have a multitude of altars to a multitude of gods. So it is that the heathen consistently misunderstand our absolute fidelity to and worship of the one true God that you closed your message with this morning, Brother Herod. They perceive our singular oneness of worship and of one God as being a weakness when it in fact is it is our strength, it is our hope, it is our salvation. In verse 10, it is obvious that he is completely drunken on his own exalted opinion of himself, his strength, and he mistakenly believes that he is doing God's work. And he boasts of God's voice and God's affirmation as he schemes the destruction of God's people. Always be very careful of the voices allow that, to, that you allow to influence your decisions. They could be voices of a drunken adversary who has come against you with human strength, completely discounting the strength of the Lord, who is your portion, your defender, and your deliverer. If the Lord is not on your side, then likely your heathen adversary will prevail. But it is the Lord who is on our side. He will not abandon you in your time of trouble. Voices that you hear from the adversary, voices of intimidation or the aerial bombardment of the enemy to weaken your resolve and soften the defenses that God has placed within you. Your most powerful weapon in time like this is to be found in prayer where you can clearly see the hand of God and clearly hear the voice of God. Rab Shaka grows even more bold and arrogant in verses 14 through 17 when he warns the people not to be deceived by the voice of the man who God had anointed to lead them. The devil is afraid that you will believe the voice of the man of God today. He's afraid that you will believe the voice and the words of the pastor that God has set over this house to lead you. The devil is afraid you will believe the man of God. But I say to the enemy, we will believe the Lord. We will prosper because we trust the voice of the the man that God has anointed to lead us. Never allow the voice of Rabshakeh to to convince you to ignore or discount the voice of of anointed leadership. And finally in verse 18 he says, don't let Hezekiah deceive you. And there's an enemy who is warring for your mind and for your ears and for your heart. And he's saying, don't let the preacher deceive you. I'm telling you today, there is only one deceiver. There is, only, there is only one liar. There is only one son of perdition who is appointed to damnation. And we already know his end. But there is also a church, the bride of Christ. The called out, the anointed, the blood bought the spirit filled, the sealed of the Lord. That is the church of the living God. If you're a part of that church, lift your voice. Believe the Lord, so shall ye prosper. Believe his prophet, so shall ye be established. Hear the word of the Lord, believe the word of the Lord, accept the word of the Lord, receive it in Jesus' name. Now clap your hands and shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Receive the word that was given to us this morning. And if you receive the word, affirm your reception of the word and your acceptance of what God said by saying, I receive it and I believe it. it. Now seal that with a voice of triumph. Clap your hands unto the Lord, all ye people, and shout, 
Shout! Shout! Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Now, if you're into social distancing, elbow bump somebody. But if you're into full contact apostolic operation, go ahead and shake hands with somebody, high five somebody, and tell them, God has shifted the atmosphere in my life today. God bless you, you're dismissed in the name of the Lord. Thank you for joining us for the service today. I trust that what you've heard and what you've felt makes a lasting impression on your life and brings blessing to your family. Please check out our social media and uh, I look forward to seeing you again right here in Jesus' name.